Well, good morning. I got told to say a couple more things about this Operation Christmas Child. The shoe boxes are due next Sunday. Next Sunday. And please note, if you're able to, it requires $7 to ship them. So per box, if you can add $7, that would be great. If you want to make it out to Samaritan's Purse, that works. Or you could make it out to us, and then we'll just write a check, a big check, however you want to do that. Play, take note of that. They're also suggesting this year that you uh, put a picture of yourself in the box so that the person that receives it, the child that receives it, will know what you look like. Isn't, I think that's a cool idea. Our son, Ben, is a sophomore at CU Boulder. He's in the business school there, and he, he, he was, is in a class where they had to pick a social service project to do, and so he and his classmates picked Operation uh, Christmas Child. Isn't that cool? And so he was out shopping yesterday and packing boxes for it. I just touched my heart that even at the CU campus, uh, boxes are going out from there. Well, good morning. I want to uh, begin today just, uh, well, I want to do one more thing before I begin today. After this service, that's why I write myself notes. They're not in my hand. If they were, I'd probably see them better. But after this service, again today, we're going to pray for Carla Sue. As you know, we are sending her out to Nepal. She's doing a short-term mission trip to, uh, to Nepal, leaving this week. So we're going to pray for her just at the close of this service. So if you would like to come and pray with her, she would be honored. We'd be honored to have you pray uh, with her, for her, with us. I just want to begin today, now I want to begin today, um, just thanking you for pastor's appreciation last week. You guys just truly touched our hearts. And, uh, you know, Ken and I just love you all so much. I just can't even communicate that adequately. And uh, I just love this church. I just love this church. I love that we are a worshiping church. Because you know what? That's just really preparation time for heaven, because that's what we're going to do in heaven. We're going to spend a lot of time worshiping the Lord. And from when this church started in 1972, I think it was, uh, incorporated, then we have had a focus on worship, and I'm just grateful for that. I'm grateful for our heart for God, for evangelism, for outreach, going to the uh, minister at Thanksgiving. And, and I'm grateful too, as I was thinking about this this week, of all the things that I'm grateful for, I'm grateful that we speak truth here. And you know, studying 1 Corinthians together has made us look pretty honestly at some truthful things, has it not? And to compare our culture to what is being said in 1 Corinthians, and it's made us a little uncomfortable, hasn't it? Because we've had to speak truth, but truth is still truth. And this is truth was, is, and always will be. And if, if the culture says something is truth and it's disagreement with this, the culture's wrong. Because people change, thoughts change, ideologies change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, I have some fun tweets for you this morning. Uh, sometimes I'm like, well, my tweets are okay. My tweets are pretty good today. Just saying, okay? I'm even looking forward to sharing them, and I've seen them a bunch of times. Um, this first one is just so, so simple. And yet I think if we live this way, it would be powerfully profound in our lives. It's just this. Today is a good day to have a good day. Isn't that good? If you could wake up every day and say, today is a good day to have a good day. Loyalty is determined by the decisions you make, not the words you say. Amen? This next one, it just touched my heart because it's, it's kind of counter to some of the ways that I'm going to say the church at large is going today that concerns me about grace. But look at what this says about grace. Grace isn't an excuse to stay in your sin. It's the power to get out of it. Isn't that good? Something will grow from all the problems you are going through, and it will be you. <laughs> When you can't sleep, have you ever thought, maybe it's God saying, we need to talk, and now you have time? <laughs> and here's my last one. You're going to have to forgive me for this one, but I thought it was funny. How to win the war on drugs. One, legalize drugs. Two, require all drugs to be purchased through Comcast customer service. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Comcast, forgive me. 
I have Comcast. All right, turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 9. Again, we are studying the book of 1 Corinthians together on Sunday mornings. And Ken addressed the closing of this chapter last week, talking about running the race to win. And he made a powerful statement that really impacted me. I'm think, I've been thinking about it all week. He said, in order to win the race, we have to dare to begin. There's a lot of truth in that. We've got to dare to begin. We've got to be willing to train. And Ken talked about my running career almost as much as he talked about his own because I didn't grow up in a running family, if you will, like he did. We didn't run. Now, I could understand the need to run if, say, a wild animal was chasing you. I would feel the need to run. Or at our house, we have this enormous bee problem. We've never had anything like this before. We've had bee hives up high. We have a beehive underneath our front porch, and every day, really late at night when it's super cold, Ken goes and digs a little bit more, and then he runs as fast as he can in, in the house because he's been stung. Nate's been stung. When Nate was stung, his legs swelled up. I mean, these aren't bees. These are bees. Like, I think they're... Um, they're killer bees. They're, whatever the worst bee is, we're saying that's what they are. Whether they're not or not, I don't know. So anyway, he finally saw, saw a little bit of the nest. He's kept digging all week. The nest that we can see right now, or what, the hive, I guess, is a little bigger than a football. That's why we have such a huge problem right now with bees, and we keep spraying it, and they won't go away. But see, I understand the need to run away from bees. But running for fun... Something about that is just a bit bizarre to me. Can any of you relate? A few of you. Well, quite a few of you. Uh, Ken is saying no, he doesn't understand that at all. Uh, you know, over the years, I've started running for exercise. And every once in a while, every once in a blue moon, I actually seem to enjoy it. But those times are sort of few and far behind few and far between for me. But, but I just want to revisit this passage again out of 1 Corinthians, the same passage that Ken talked about last week, just giving you my own spin on it. And as I've looked at this passage, it seems that Paul is making an, making an analogy between running in the natural world, going for a run, and our spiritual race, our spiritual run, our spiritual walk with God. And so today, I want to draw some comparisons of just as, as myself, as a runner, and, and, it, and then again in my spiritual life, comparing those two, two things. So read this with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 24. Ken read out of the New Living last week, so I'm going to read out of the New American Standard. 1 Corinthians 9 and 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Then they do it to receive a perishable wreath, which Ken told us last week was a celery wreath, which we all thought was funny. But we, an imperishable, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. Notice that Paul begins this paragraph, this section, asking a question, do you not know? And it seems to me whenever Paul asks this question, do you not know, in the scripture, he knows that is, he is fairly confident that his audience already knows. They already know the answer. And as Ken said last week, the Greeks, the Corinthians, were athletes. They prized physical fitness. They do know that in a race, only one receives the prize. But consider this next phrase. It says, but run in such a way that you may win. But Paul here actually uses the verb form that's plural. Not singular, but plural. So this, in other words, this would be a more accurate translation. You all run in such a way that you all may win. In a 5K race, the prize is given to the winner. But in our spiritual life, Paul is saying the prize can be won by each and every person, by each and every believer. We can all be winners. 
And in a 5K race, we're not competing. In a 5K race, you're competing against people. I ran a 5K race once by myself. It's the only race I've run by myself. And it was around City Park in Denver. And they had a kids race first. And so I, I don't even know why I'm going to this. This is a huge bunny trail. Maybe God will give me a segue. And maybe I'll just have to say, I don't know why I'm telling you this. But anyway, the kids ran first. And so I was up with my kids right at the start of the race. This was a huge race, like big big wigs politicals were there and so I just got in the front of the start of the race and Ken kept trying to say to me move back move back move back behind all these people but I didn't I just started the race right at the front with everybody else and all these people were running into me fussing at me saying you're running too slow to be this this high the point is God gave me this segue we don't compete against each other in our spiritual race Woohoo! thank you Lord we uh <laughs> We, uh, we, we're running this together. We're not running each other down. They almost, they wanted to run me down. And Ken at the end of the race said, I tried to get you to move to the back of the race, but you would never look at me. Look at other people. They'll help you. That's where I'm going this morning. I'm just going to keep stretching this as far as I possibly can. <laughs> I do want to add here also that the prize that the Bible is talking about here in our spiritual race is not salvation. Paul is not urging us to work harder, to run harder in order to win our entrance into heaven. The scripture is very clear that salvation is what? A free gift of God. You cannot earn it. You cannot win it. You simply have to what? Receive it. So what is this race then that Paul is talking about? What is the prize? And I was just asking God about this and, and thinking about this, praying about this this week. And this is the answer that I came up with. This race is living a lifestyle that honors our God. This is a race about running in a manner worthy of our calling. It's living a life of obedience that pleases the Almighty. It's running in such a way as to accomplish that which God has ordained in your life. Do you know that God has a calling on your life? And the enemy is going to do everything he can do to derail that calling. And I pray for my kids all the time and for myself that we would fulfill the God-ordained calling on our life. That's running the race to win. And the prize then, I believe, ultimately, the prize is hearing God say, Well done, good and faithful servant. But you know, the prize additionally is also living a lifestyle that is characterized by peace and hope and joy and love, even in a troubled, distressed world. It's knowing the joy of the Lord is my strength. See, just as there are physical endorphins, I've discovered the power of physical endorphins. When I push myself really hard, th these hormones are released in my body that makes this go, this is fun. I don't know how that works, but God <laughs> created us that way. Um, I was running with Jill. Her husband, Patrick, is here. I was bragging a little bit that I've seen his wife and his kids since he has. But, Patrick, we're glad to have you here. He's here. And uh, I went to go. I went to go. While he came here, I went there to help her. But she and I went for a run. We ran about three miles. You can run a lot farther in Hawaii because there's actually thick air. And uh, those in, I said at, to Jill at the end, I just love to run. And she said, it's those endorphins. <laughs> But just as there are endorphins in, in, in our physical body, so I believe that the Holy Spirit will release endorphins in our soul and in our spirit as we choose to run the race, living a life that's pleasing to God, walking in obedience. Let me tell you a little bit about my running career. When I started running shortly after I had Caleb, I could maybe run halfway around the block. And if that far, and then I was like, <gasps> you know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I hadn't run probably since field day in fifth grade. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I had no training. <coughs> that water went down wrong. I had no training. I had no endurance. I remember, this is the honest to God truth, I was running and I was saying, I buffet my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I may myself may not be disqualified. I buffet my body. It was, it was horrible. I could run a half a block, a block, maybe a block and a half, but every other day I went out running and I just kept adding half a block and half a block and half a block to the point where at my peak, and I'm not at my peak right now, in any stretch of the imagination. But at my peak, I could run about eight miles without stopping. 
And, uh, but I had to train my body to do it. But I constantly had to fight the desire to give up. The, I'm not that into this today. I am too tired. I'm too thirsty. I didn't sleep good. I'm too, I could come up with any excuse to fill in there. And I think the same can be true for us in our spiritual race. God, I'm too tired to pray today. I'm too busy to take time to read the scripture. I've got too much on my plate today to stop and talk to this person that you've put on my heart to reach out to. See, the enemy is always trying to derail us from the race. We've got to be aware that we've got an enemy, and he's whispering us, getting us, trying to get us to stop running. You know, and just in my own struggle over the years with with physical running, there are two main things that make me want to quit. Just as I'm out on a run, there's two things that make me want to quit. And the first one is that I am not a fan of hills. The hills in Colorado are hills. Ken and I ran a 5K in Florida, and they said, there's a hill in this, and all the runners went, ugh. And I ran the whole race going, where's the hill? It was a dirt pile. I'm not kidding. (laughs) That is a hill in Florida. In Colorado, we got some hills, okay? So hills can take me out. And, you know, you drive a car somewhere, and unless you're really observant, you don't really notice the hills. But when you're running, you notice every little change in elevation. And uh, hills can be killers, especially, again, in Colorado where the hills are large and the air is thin. So both my brother and my sister, when they were about my age, ran marathons, so 26-something miles. And, uh, you know, as the youngest child in the family, there's always just kind of this nagging desire to keep up with them, to keep up with the Joneses, to keep up with my siblings. But in this area of marathons, I have absolutely no desire to keep up with them. It is so not on my bucket list. Um, But it made me think about them this week, and it made me think about some famous marathons, big, huge races. You know, the New York Marathon, some famous marathons, the New York Marathon, It has some differences in elevation, but it's not huge. Here's a graph, and I hope you can see this, of the elevation changes of the New York Marathon. The Chicago Marathon has been nicknamed the Pancake Marathon because it's so flat. My sister ran the San Francisco Marathon, and it has a nickname as well. It's called the race that even marathoners fear because like San Francisco, it goes up and down and up and down. But probably the most famous of all marathons is what? The Boston Marathon. And if you look at this graph closely, look at this, you will notice that the first 16 miles of the Boston Marathon are downhill. And you know, one thing I've discovered as a runner, it's easier to run downhill. (laughs) Just a tip for you. <laughs> my sister and I ran a 5K from this side of Aurora to, to from north to south. And when we started the race, I knew enough of the, the landscape that I thought we are running this entire race uphill. And we did. The whole race was uphill. It was a tough race. I heard that the original designers, the course designers of the Boston Marathon, set up this course such that it would take out weakened runners. And I'm going to play a pun on words here, but weakened, W-E-A-K-E-N-D, weakened runners, and weekend runners, W-E-E-K-E-N-D. It would take out both of them because they would start running and think they were doing so good for 16 miles, you run downhill. But then the next five miles are a steady uphill climb. And I don't know how you can see this, but one of those hills in there is very steep. It's an intense climb. It's a huge elevation climb. There was a guy that did the study that said of all the major marathons, except for maybe the Big Sur, which I don't even know, that's in California, I guess, that of all the, this is the hardest climb. And they've given this this, uh, hill a nickname, and you need to know that The runners running up this hill have already run 20 miles. And then they hit this hill, and it's called Heartbreak Hill. That's what it's called. Google it. Google Heartbreak Hill, and the Boston Marathon will come up. And you won't make it up Heartbreak Hill unless you've really trained. And many runners fall out of the race at this hill. And you know what? That can be true for us also in our spiritual life when we hit Heartbreak Hill. I was thinking this week about how to thank you for pastors 
appreciation last week, and I, I started to consider all the things that we've gone through as a church. We've gone through some tough things. Someone in our church lost a nine-month-old baby to RSV on Christmas Day. It was tough. We lost another child to leukemia, another to SIDS. We lost a worship team member to a drunk driver and someone else to suicide. We lost our administrator to cancer. Many of you have lost parents or spouses or siblings. We have walked through the valley of the shadow of death together. We have walked through times of crisis, of divorce, of financial problems, of sickness, of serious life-threatening accidents, of disappointments in our life that have become all-consuming for people. We have gone through times where we are running up heartbreak hill. And there's something in us sometimes that wants to say, God, this is too hard. The hill is too steep. I don't want to run anymore. But see, the Bible tells us to run the race to win. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, near the end of his life, he wrote, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Don't let the enemy convince you that the race is too hard, that the hill is too steep. Again, we have an enemy. He will do everything he can do to derail us, to to convince us, to pull out because it's just too hard. Finish the race. Do you know that God never promised that life would be easy or painless or hill free? He did promise that he would be with us. He did tell us that he was for us. And he instructed us to be with each other. Again, 1 Corinthians 9, we don't see this unless you do a little digging, but that verb form there is plural. We are to run this race together, winning together. Hebrews 9 tells us not to forsake assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encourage each other. We need each other. We're stronger together. You know, one of our core values that has developed over the years as a church, and, and, and this is in our mission statement, is that we are a place of belonging. This church is a place of belonging. We're a church family. It's a place to belong. And when you're part of a family, then you go through hard things with other people. You don't go through it alone. You have support. And I was thinking about that example out of Exodus 17 of the Israelites. And, and, and uh, they were in a battle with the Amalekites. And Moses was their leader. And whenever Moses lifted his hands up toward God, then the Israelites won the battle. But when Moses grew weary, and wouldn't you grow weary after a while? I would grow weary after not very much time at all. In fact, that's starting to happen right now. But, but, you know, after a while, Moses grew weary, and he brought down his hands. And you know what? The Israelites started losing, and the Amalekites started winning. And they realized that if Moses lifted up his hands toward God, then then the, the Israelites would win. So what happened? Aaron came on this side, and Hur came on this side, and they lifted up his hands. They supported him. And that's who we are supposed to be to each other. We're are supposed to stand together and help each other run this run together. We need each other, and we need people who will hold us up when we grow weary. That's the role of the church. We were never called to run this race alone. And you know, all of us will experience disappointments in our lives, times of heartbreak, hill experiences. And we need others who will run along beside us and support us. You know, there's a reason that we sent Pastor Tim to Pittsburgh to a conference. I wish we had been able to send him to Hawaii, but we sent him to Pittsburgh and <laughs> for a conference with the Stevens Ministry. And it's a ministry that comes alongside those who are running up Heartbreak Hill. And we've developed this ministry. We're developing it right now. We call it our, our, prayer t- our care team, our care team. And, and there's all this training going on right now behind the scenes because we are called to care for each other. And we're called to run up Heartbreak Hill together. This is what I'm saying. When you find yourself running up Heartbreak Hill, you need God. Yeah. James 4 and 8 says, draw near to God and he will what? Draw near to you. It's a promise. It's a promise of God. But when we're running up Heart Ray Hill, we also need others to come beside us. 
And with godly people, and ultimately with God himself, we can survive and keep running up the heartbreak hills of life. You know, the second thing that causes me to contemplate quitting a run when I'm out running is simply little irritations. Maybe my shoelaces aren't tied quite enough, tight enough. Or my sock is rubbing, rubbing my foot just wrong and causing me discomfort. Headwinds are a huge irritation to me, particularly when I'm running and don't realize that I have a tailwind that's kind of just pushing me along, and then I turn around to run back the other way, and suddenly I'm faced with wind. It, it rocks my world. It messes with me. It makes me want to quit. Another thing that makes me want to quit is when I'm running, and I'm totally out of breath, and I'm taking gasping for air, and suddenly I hit a place where there's a lot of gnats. Which, since we live in a golf course community, that happens quite frequently. And you're like, ah. And you know what? I want to quit. It's just a little irritation, but it makes me want to quit. I got the response out of you that I was looking for. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Life is full of little irritations. Let me share you some that I've gone through. When the car won't start, when the refrigerator stops running, when your coworker or your boss or your friend or your roommate or, or whoever treats you poorly, when you feel injustice, when your kids don't come home from school and decide to go to the park and play football without telling you, and they're missing for over an hour, and you're not home to go figure out where they are. That happened to me a couple weeks ago. That was an irritation. When your two-year-old becomes a human tornado and decides to redecorate your house with a magic marker, when your child struggles in school academically or socially, when you're sick or injured somehow and you, you're living in pain, it's an irritation. Sorry for being so graphic, but when your dog pees on the floor or throws up on your bed or, or, or whatever, it's an irritation. Or here's one for you. This is, this is just off the charts. But when your child comes to tell you in the middle of the night that they have a bloody nose and then he sneezes... And you feel warm stickiness all over your face and all over. Isn't it isn't being a parent just, you just got to love it. These have all happened to me in my life. And the truth is, is that life is full of little irritations. And they can wear on us. And they can make us feel worn and weary or tired, especially when they start adding up on each other. That 10th Avenue North song I love, I'm tired, I'm worn. My heart is heavy from the work it takes to keep on breathing. And even though the irritations are little in the grand scheme of life, when they all start to add together, they can become consuming and they can make us want to stop running. I thought, why does God, who is infinite, omnipotent, all-powerful, why doesn't he just take away those irritations? Like, it seems like he could easily just make them go away. And I was thinking about that this week. And you know, I love jewelry. If you know me, I love jewelry. But these are my mom's string of pearls. These are actually real, so I'm being very careful with them. But have you ever thought about how pearls are formed? A pearl is formed when an oyster is formed in an oyster shell because an irritation finds its way into the inside of that shell. And the oyster wraps that irritation in a substance called mother of pearl. And in the end, the irritation is gone, but a costly, beautiful pearl is formed. And is it possible that God allows us to go through irritations in our lives because he's in the business of making pearls? in us. I also love that song by Gunger, you make everything new. And then it goes on to say, he makes beautiful things out of us, out of us. I think God's in the pearl making business. And that's why he allows irritations to be there. I got permission to share this story but one of my children really struggled in school academically, and it was really hard on me. 
And because he kind of just had all these different issues stacked against him, just, and I'm not going to go into what they are because then you'd figure out who it was. But, um, <laughs> but just issue after issue after issue after issue was just kind of, was, it, it made school hard for him, stacked against him. And in fact, his second grade teacher asked Ken and I to hold him back, asked us to have him redo second grade. And that was hard. And uh, Ken and I prayed about it, and we decided that I could tutor him and help him, so we didn't hold him back. But for a variety of reasons, life, school life, was stacked against him. And this child struggled for many years, and it was hard on him, and it was hard on me. And his freshman year of high school, he had two teachers that just rubbed me wrong. Now, I tend to be extremely loyal to teachers. I tend to be extremely patient with them because I was one. I know the workload. I, I know what they go through. Life as a teacher is tough, and I'm very aware of that because I was one. But these teachers just rub, these two teachers just rubbed me wrong. One of the teachers um, at a parent-teacher conference that I was with with my son, it was him and me, and I can't remember if Ken was there or not, but anyway, she was talking to us, and she said to our son, uh, you are consistently inconsistent. And it was hard. It was funny with a knife. You know what I'm talking about? And it was unkind. Even if there was a little bit of truth in there, it was unkind. And it bothered me. And it bothered him. And it was an irritation that just rubbed me wrong. The other teacher that I really struggled with almost seemed to have a vendetta against my son. In fact, I wondered if she had it against all boys because I heard her say quite frequently how great her daughters were and how wonderful girls are. And, and, and you know, my world is all boy. And, and I know that boys are the best. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> but it's like she just had it out for boys, and mine was at the top of the list, it seemed like. And, and, and her personality, her tone during conferences just hit me wrong. She was angry. She was a negative person, and I reacted to her, and I honest to goodness thought, you need to retire. <laughs> that really went through my mind. Um, but by the grace of God, I did not share that with her or anyone else. Um, but I went to a, stu a, a parent conference, and she asked, she was talking to my son, and she said, how are you doing on the big English paper that's due tomorrow, the seven-page paper that's due tomorrow? And he looked at her and said, actually, I haven't started it yet. And I wanted to crawl in a hole and hide, especially when I saw the look of disapproval and disdain on her face. And as we walked out to the car that night, after that exchange, I said, you really haven't started this paper yet? And he said, well, I haven't finished the book. And I thought, this is bad. <laughs> this is really, really bad. <laughs> And so my sister, you're going to learn something about me today. <laughs> uh, so my sister was at my home when we got there after that conference, about 8 o'clock at night. And this is a truthful account of what happened. I appeal to my sister to verify the authenticity of this story. And I think maybe this is a confession, just in the interest of being real and honest. But my sister and I wrote that paper for him that night with him sitting there giving us his input. And let me just say this, don't do this at home. Like they say on TV, don't try this at home. Do not emulate me. Again, I'm confessing, do not do your children's homework. But I did. And my sister, fortunately, has been an English teacher for like 30 years, and so of course she had read the book, which really helped when you're writing a paper about a book, if you've read the book. And in essence, I write for a living. I view myself as I write sermons for a living. And so between her English skills and my writing so frequently, we made a really good writing team. Just <laughs> saying. And we whipped out that paper, and uh, we were writing about the motif and the symbolism of the characters and the events and the underlying theme and the tone of the author. It was a really good paper. 
And, and I promise you that that English teacher, as she was reading it, did not find any syntax errors or grammatical errors or spelling mistakes because a teacher wrote it. Actually, two teachers wrote it. And I did wonder if we'd get caught. Uh, this is, again, a, a confession, or at least questioned or something. Uh, because it was an advanced paper turned in by a student who at 8 o'clock at night had admitted to his teacher that he hadn't started it yet. And I can only imagine that that English teacher scoured the internet trying to discover where this student had plagiarized this from. <laughs> but it wasn't plagiarized, it was original. And when we got his paper back, I, I shouldn't say when he got his paper back, it did feel like when we got his paper back. <laughs> he showed it to me and he only got a B. I could not believe it. He was happy. I was just in. I was astounded. And I called my sister on the phone and I said, we only got a B. <laughs> uh, Lord, forgive me. Do not do this at home. But it was like this teacher had it out for him. He couldn't win. And I just looked to him and said, you just got to do the best you can do, but you just can't win. And it rubbed at me. It was an irritation to me all year. And I remember saying to my son, because at the end of that year, this teacher did retire, kid you not. And I said to my son with total sarcasm, aren't you glad that you got to have her before she retired? And then he and I looked at each other, and we both just rolled our eyes. And, but see, as I look back on that experience with those two teachers, I was making some pearls. And you know what? I got the opportunity to once again learn the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. Because I had a few things I would have liked to say to them, and I tend to be pretty verbal and say what I think, which is not always a good thing. It feels good for the first five minutes, but after that, not so much. I know you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control, and I hate this little last phrase, in all things. Even with teachers that rub you wrong. And I learned to hold my tongue and not say what I thought. And I had to choose to run through that entire school year exercising self-control. And my filter grew stronger. And those teachers irritated me and rubbed me the wrong way. But you know what? I kept entrusting that to God. I kept entrusting my son to God. And what I didn't realize at the time is that I was making pearls because I was covering that irritation with praise and with prayer. And God turned that school problem around. I just feel like I've got to brag a little bit on that same kid because I've been a little hard on him this morning, though he did give me permission. But, you know, as a senior in high school, in the same high school, even though he was taking AP classes like AP Calculus and AP Physics, he got straight A's every single quarter in every single class. And so you know what? God turned that around. And he made some pearls too. And now he's a thriving, excelling college student. But my point is this. In life, we will go through situations where things just irritate us. People just irritate us. It might be me. God have mercy. But you know, irritations can make us want to pull out of the race. I'm so angry about this today, God. I just can't pray. Life is so unfair. It's been so unjust. I just can't praise you today. Or God, why have you allowed this heartbreak hill thing to happen? It's too much. And my message to us today, my message to you, my message to me is that in spite of life's irritations, in spite of life's hills, just keep running. Amen? Just keep running. Don't let the enemy pull you off the course and try to convince you to stop. Endure to the end. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians says, run in such a way that you may win. And you know what? You do it 
by calling on God and saying, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And when God says all times, I think he means all times. Even when teachers are mean and unjust and unfair and just like girls. It's true. There are a lot of teachers. Oh, I shouldn't even say that. There are teachers out there that just like girls. I've met them, all of them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> God, I need my filter back. <laughs> Exercise self-control in all things. You know what? When you go through difficult things and you choose to pray and you choose to praise and you read the word and you're in church, you're building a mother of pearl around that irritation and God is making pearls out of you. What's the tweet I gave you? Something will grow from all the problems you are going through and it will be you. And know this, think about this. I'm almost done. In an oyster shell, the larger the irritation, the bigger the pearl. Because the more coats of mother of pearl are, are, are necessary to wrap around that point of pain. I read this this week, it hit me. This is Revelation 21, 21. I'm reading Revelation in my time with the Lord right now. And it says this, it's talking about heaven. Revelation 21, 21, talking about heaven, says this. And the 12 gates, and it's talking about the 12 gates of heaven, were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. Huge, massive pearls make up the gates of heaven. Consider the suffering that went into making heaven available for us. The magnitude. What I say to myself when life gets tough is that I'm just going to keep running. And somewhere in all of this, I'm making pearls. I'm making pearls. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, will the worship team come up here? Lord Jesus, we just need you. We love you. We want to follow you wholeheartedly. We want our lives to count for you. We want to fulfill our God-ordained destiny on here. Lord, help me to keep running. Will you just pray that way for yourself? That God would help you just to keep running, to run the race with endurance. It says of Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. God, help us to run with endurance. Lord, help me to run with endurance. just cry out to you in Jesus name amen I just I just want to say one more thing that I forgot but Kevin the road has been steep for you at times and now I'm gonna cry but you've made pearls and you're making pearls and we can see it I don't know if you can see it but we see it and the way you honored us last week, you know, as, as, as stepping in a little bit as surrogate parents here and there, I'll never forget it. Touch my heart. It's our honor to have you in our home. Amen. It's our honor and our privilege. And we are so proud of the man of God you've become. And I am so proud of the way that you're influencing my little men. With their older brothers gone, you've stepped in, surrogate brother. Isn't it interesting how God makes it go full circle? proud of you and I thank you thank you let's worship the Lord